What They Don't Tell You brings you real conversations about wealth management that real people have behind closed doors. Whether it's for yourself or a loved one, senior care is a matter that affects everyone. COVID-19 may have changed how we view our senior care options, but the fundamental knowledge to make the right decision hasn't changed. In this episode, we discuss the misconceptions surrounding these services, the various care options available to make aging comfortable and safe, and the anticipated costs to consider. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode eight of our series, What They Don't Tell You. My name is Anna Premislova, investment advisor here at CWB McLean & Partners. And today I'm joined by a very special guest, Karen Skoritz of Just Like Family Home Care. And Karen, I'm so excited to have you on the episode with us today. Uh, I think this is going to be a topic that applies to so many families, and I think we'll be hard pressed to find anyone that doesn't feel a connection to the stories that you are going to tell today. But before we get into all of that, I know that you've had a varied career over the years, uh, but in fact, senior care and elder care and home care is a little bit of a homecoming for you as an industry. So I would love uh, to have our audience hear a little bit more about your uh, your history before we get going. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, I um, grew up in the long-term care industry. My dad managed uh, a couple buildings in Winnipeg. And as a child, I used to go after school as a candy striper and hand out uh, various things and orange juice to the to the um, clients that were living there. And then um, as my career progressed later in life, I worked a lot in non uh, or in health based nonprofits, including acting executive director of Hospice Calgary. And I also uh, would go into the for-profit business of the REITs and I managed 400 suites and transition beds here in Calgary for one of the larger REITs. And, um, and I've also been a caregiver to adults with disabilities through a government program that also manages family managed um, funding for seniors. So um, as I was thinking about what I wanted to do next in my career when I was turning 50 a few years ago, I started to think about all my experience and it all came together with home care. And Karen, how does that tie in to Just Like Family and the business that you now co-own here in Calgary? So um, I started researching what might be available. I was actually approached about a home care business about 15 years ago, and I actually just didn't feel uh, quite ready to take on such a big task of running that business. And um, now that I felt more prepared and I had more information and experience behind me, Um, I started researching some companies and um, uh, just found Just Like Family Home Care, which is actually a 100% Canadian-based home care company, which is actually uh, fairly unusual. A lot of them are US-based. I really love their approach of being family-friendly and very, very personable and also small. When you call us, you're going to get us. You're not going to get a call center somewhere. So I just really um, loved all that they stood for and we uh, purchased both franchises for Calgary, Calgary North and Calgary South. Mm -hmm. Well, I love hearing your story, Karen. It seems like such a natural fit, not only between your own experiences and just like family, uh, but also, you know, in the way that uh, that I feel that we treat clients at uh, CWB McLean and Partners. So a very natural connection. And uh, like I mentioned at the start of our conversation, I think this topic, especially with the trends and demographics that we are seeing across Canada of an aging population, that you would be hard pressed to find a family that hasn't been touched by this in some way, either through looking for these services for themselves or for a loved one. Uh, And I can tell you that in our conversations, you know, I know you always speak in general terms about the various families that you uh, help and deal with, uh, but it very much rings true to me. You know, uh, my grandparents uh, had a 50 plus year long, very happy marriage. Uh, which started in Ukraine, and they obviously immigrated to Canada with our family uh, quite a few decades ago now. But uh, one tradition that they had from the very early days of their marriage is that every day at four o'clock, grandpa would pick up, you know, my little mom from kindergarten, and they would walk and pick my grandma up from the end of her shift at her job. 
And, uh, you know, many decades later and, and a world apart um, here in Canada, my grandpa did start experiencing dementia and Alzheimer's uh, symptoms as, uh, as he grew older. And for many years, my grandma was able to keep him safe and, and, and healthy and occupied within the home that they share. But uh, eventually we did get that call of authorities calling and saying, you know, we've located a gentleman. He's walking, you know, outdoors in a Canadian winter in clothing not appropriate for the weather. And he's looking to pick up his wife from work. But of course, now, you know, we're half a world and 50 years later. And uh, in our discussions, I found that that's actually a pretty, you know, not unusual uh, scenario that you find uh, folks call you about. So could you maybe tell us, you know, what does that typical phone call sound like when a family first reaches out to you? And then in your ideal world, if you could coach families ahead of time, what would it sound like if you had your way? Well, Anna, everybody has parents, right? So yeah, this uh, topic of home care and senior aging affects everybody. And uh, going back to your story, 61% of uh, people with dementia actually live at home. Um, so it is a little scary. And we do get a lot of calls similar to yours where I've had adult children say, mom ran away <laughs> and they had to call the helicopters looking for her. Or someone else might say, oh, you know, our parents just, or my dad just needs more medication and he'll be fine. And um, that makes me a little concerned because it just tells me that people aren't researching enough. I always say, if something isn't right, there's a reason for that. And we need to kind of dig a little deeper and find out what, what, what's causing some of the challenges. Um, for example, one of my clients was having a really, really tough time eating and swallowing. And um, the family just was frustrated. And it just turned out that she was really, really dehydrated. So everything was very scratchy. So once we dealt with the dehydration, then she's able to eat. Now she's eating bowls of pasta and <laughs> spaghetti and she's doing really, really well. But again, it's getting down to what, what is causing a, a problem. Um, a lot of times I get calls from adult children as well, and they're just really, really frustrated. You know, our our parents um, always think of us as, as children, even though we grow up and we're adults, in, in their minds, we're still their children. So there's a lot of conflict quite often between what the children think their parents need, uh, sound familiar <laughs> growing up, and then what your parents want, you know, or what they think they're capable of. And I get calls from adult uh, children often in that exasperation just saying i just want to be the the child i just want to be i just want to have that relationship again with my parents and not be the caregiver so um a lot of times just what i would say is a, people just aren't prepared um they aren't prepared for the cost of care they're not prepared emotionally for the changes that their parents are going through and they might have a lot of feelings of guilt or uh, even deeper anger, you know, uh, towards their parent. Um, but going back to what an ideal call should be would be uh, the, the opposite, right? More education, more awareness, calling much earlier for support and care versus waiting for a crisis call. Um, having those really tough conversations about what the parent really wants as, as they age. And what we know in the industry is that seniors really do want to stay at home. They've been telling us for telling us that for a very, very long time. And um, so it's having the conversation with a parent about, OK, if we stay at home the way my 85 year old father wants to do, we know we have to financially plan to bring in all the supports for him. Right. And Karen, I think you hit on something so important there that a large part of what you do is educating people. What I think we sometimes don't consider or forget is that a lot of people looking for your types of services and just generally trying to navigate this industry right now for their own care, whether now or into the future, their last experience with senior care, elder care might have been in the 60s and 70s when they were helping their own parents try to navigate, you know, this vast expanse of, of the various options. And I imagine, Karen, that the types of options available today are probably very different and hopefully more varied than what was available in the 60s and 70s. Do you find that's the case? And could you maybe take us through the broad categories of what people can pick from these days? Absolutely. There's so many more options, which is the wonderful thing about the change that this industry has gone through over the years. Um, aging, though, begins at home, right? We are in our homes and um, the health problems and things start to happen in our home. So home care, whether it be government 
um, subsidized home care or private home care is sort of the first place and hopefully early enough, like I mentioned, that we, we stay and help the client remain for as long as possible, even through till the end of life in their own home. But if you're looking at other options outside of the home, um, in 1993, the REIT industry came to market here in Canada, and that's when um, they started opening up um, wonderful options for independent and assisted living for seniors. The transition is difficult, of course, um, but overall, people who um, have made the transition, in my experience, said, I should have done this earlier. I should have thought about it. Unfortunately, COVID has really turned things on its heel, um, and now people are not wanting to move into the residences because of everything we've heard in the news. Um, but it still remains a really great option for families, um, especially when you feel like you have no other option. Then the next level of care would be long-term or memory care, I should say, and then it would be long-term care, which is subsidized by the government. And not often attached to that might be palliative and um, hospice care as well. Um, I'm bringing that piece up only because we're seeing a bit of a change where people are thinking more about what their options are at end of life and there are more requests and more information and more options to um, have your last days and to live out your life at home. And Karen, as you take us through those kind of four broad options, I imagine that that's actually news to some people that either people don't realize that this, you know, variety of options exists or, you know, just how in depth each of those broader categories can be. So what are some of the most common fears or misconceptions that you have to deal with again, when a family does reach out to you for the first time mm -hmm. and you're taking them through this educational, you know, piece that you're talking to us about today? Well, that's a very good question, Anna, um, and I'm taking a deep breath because that is often what I end up having to do. Um, people call me and they just don't understand how the healthcare system works. Um, our system is really designed for crisis. And um, when they've had a parent that has gone into hospital with hip replacement, for example, and they're older and more frail and they may have been assessed that they can't go home. Um, I have a very frantic adult child on the other end of the line saying, oh, my mom and needs to move right away, like as soon as they're released and they need to move into your building. And unfortunately, um, you know, I had to break the hard news that because they hadn't done the research, um, there typically ha has been a two-year wait list for independent and long-term care. So families are just floored and shocked. And then what do you do next, right? A lot of people think the government's always going to be there to take care of you. And that just isn't the case. And I think more people understand that now after we've gone through COVID and long-term care and senior information has been in the news quite a bit. Um, the government has just gone through so many cutbacks over the years. Um, when my mom had home care from the government, uh, they did mm -hmm. come in and they did do more ho house housework for her. They did help prepare meals and they just don't do things like that anymore. Uh, they don't have the financial resources or the staffing in a lot of uh, in a lot of cases. Um, so that's another surprise. You know, uh, seniors are often surprised about how short the visits are with uh, mm -hmm. provincial home care coming in. Right now, on average, someone might get two showers a week or a 15 minute visit to change their compression stocking. So it's in and out. Um, back to home care, we fill the gaps. And again, we like to be early in the home with the client, getting to know them, getting to know the family member, and we progress and add on services as their care needs are, as they need. Um, another misconception is that home care is uh, for crisis, right? And mm -hmm. I just alluded to that. We really aren't. We really are a holistic, we take a holistic approach. Um, wanting to, like I said, build a relationship with the family and the client, know what their likes and dislikes are, know um, what to watch out for in terms of their health changes and be with them along that whole journey. And part of the best thing is that relationship. Um, it's so nice. I know I'm doing my job when people um, that I work with say, Karen, we want to invite you for dinner because we really do want that approach of being just like family so that we feel part of the family network part of the care team for the family and the and the aging parent. 
Now you alluded there, Karen, that you, uh, you know, as as the name of of the business suggests, uh, want to really be part of that family, right? And start early and incrementally and build up that relationship over time. Versus the call of, you know, mom or dad needs needs a bed tomorrow. What do we do? Uh, can you maybe talk to us a little bit about how it is that a service like yours can mediate or be a third party in what I imagine is often, you know, a pretty tenuous conversation? Do you find that there's often resistance within the family? And, and how do you play into that? How do you work around that? Um, yeah, the, the, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of laughing because there's lots of resistance, as I mentioned earlier. Um, Adult children have one idea and parents have another idea and the conflict and the frustration can really be quite strong um, to the point where um, sometimes adult children say, look, you know, if you're not going to bring in the home care and extra support, then we are going to look at some assisted living options for you, which would remove them from their home. It's very, very upsetting. But children feel like they're at adult children feel like they're at the place where they almost have to provide an ultimatum to a parent um, for them to get the help. Because parents t can also be a little bit stubborn. Um, they feel that, you know, I mean, aging is tough, right? It's, it's a lot of fear. They're very afraid of losing their independence. Um, so going back to the third party, again, we can step in in a situation like um, a, an adult child is really worried about their parent driving. They had an accident. You know, they really shouldn't be driving anymore. Um, maybe they aren't getting the support from the doctor who could intervene and help in the transition of removing the driver's license, but maybe the family doesn't want to go that route. Just like family or a home care company also has um, a huge variety of services. We're not just medical focused. Um, again, it's very holistic. We start from companionship and homemaking, going through to personal care, but there's other things. We have transportation services to help that parent um, go on their errands or medical appointments. So they're not going to lose their independence, but at least someone is there to provide some safety and make sure their parent is getting around doing what they need to do with some support. And so that's a really great compromise. And then for us, you know, that was our third party, our way of helping to intervene and help a family through the transition. Because often you just don't know what to do, you know, and it's and as a home care company, we've seen a lot of different scenarios and we might be able to come up with a solution or an option for a family that works that they just never thought of before, right? Yeah, no, I think we can all relate to the fact that sometimes, you know, the same advice, as good as it might be, uh, can be difficult to swallow when coming from a family member, right? No matter which side of that spectrum you're on. So uh, so I can imagine how important it is uh, for some families to have that independent third party that maybe, you know, might say the same words, but it might just land a little bit differently and uh, and help mediate some of that resistance. Sorry, if I could um, just give another, another really common example. A lot of parents have emergency call buttons, uh, you know, necklaces or bracelets and there's often a lot of resistance and a lot of frustration on the adult child's end mom's never wearing it she just never puts it on I don't understand it's for her safety and sometimes it just takes again a home care company or or another professional coming in and saying mom you know what this is why we're asking you to do this it's for your safety and they tend to listen to more third party people giving them advice than sometimes their parent, uh, their, their children. So it is good to source for extra resources in the community, whether it be home care or a, a lawyer or your doctor or the physiotherapist or someone that can help through help the family work through some of the challenges they have. Absolutely. I can see how valuable that would be. Uh, maybe I'll invite you to dinner sometime with me and my partner. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and Karen, you know, I think uh, this entire conversation has been already, you know, just chock full of information for folks, but we would be remiss if we were to wrap up this conversation, you know, in the spirit of what they don't tell you without addressing the elephant in the room, which is the cost of these various options. And in fact, you already mentioned to us that one of the biggest misconceptions that families sometimes have is that home care is prohibitively expensive. And so it's not even worth pursuing that route, you know, until there are no other options left. So let's maybe talk about that. You know, what are some of the realistic costs um, that are associated with some of these options? Because, you know, in my own practice, I tell my clients all the time that 
the market is not planning for your retirement. The S&P 500 doesn't care, you know, that you have your medical needs taken care of uh, when you reach uh, the age where you need them. You know, your portfolio manager cares and your portfolio itself certainly should be uh, should be looking towards that goal. Uh, but I think perhaps, you know, it's a movement in the entire investment management industry where we're saying, you know, look, investment returns, that bottom line are important and it's still a focus of our conversations. But let's make sure it's not the only thing we're looking at, right? And instead, we're talking about your long-term goals, the kind of expenses, the kind of lifestyle you want to live when your portfolio is the one paying you in retirement and making sure that those are the goals that it's working towards and it's going to meet. And so in that conversation, it's often really important for myself and the client to understand what those costs might look like. Because, you know, this isn't really a conversation that you want to have on a Sunday morning. It's not the most pleasant sometimes things to talk about. Uh, but as you've already mentioned, the sooner you address it and the more proactively you plan for it, the better off you'll be. So perhaps you can share some uh, some benchmarks for us on, on what this can cost. This is why we connected, right, Anna? We talked about financial planning and um, how the industry in general doesn't go the step further and talk and really help a client dig into what are the care costs that they might be having. So it's really important to investigate the health history of your client or our client as well, and to understand um, you know, what they've gone through in the past, which might lead to understanding what they might be anticipating and having to deal with as they age in the future. Um, is there a hip replacement? I mean, hip replacements are super common, and so is there one planned in the future? Um, sometimes they go well, and sometimes they don't. Have they investigated um, what the care costs are gonna be around that operation? Are they going to need someone to come in and, and provide extra support? Um, so, yeah, I, I mentioned earlier that if you bring in services and support early, it can also like a, it can slow down the process of needing more care because we're there to help and assist and support. But also, um, it, it helps avert or divert away from crisis as well, and that's when it gets really expensive is when you're all of a sudden hit with a crisis situation. Um, and like I said earlier, all of a sudden mom's coming out of this, out of hip surgery, she can't go home. And do you have a building? You know, do you have a spot in a building where mom can move to? And um, uh, often without doing the research, families are really surprised to find out how small the accommodation is compared to the family home. And the downsizing is very hard for families and especially seniors and especially women to go through. And um, they're going to be paying for a small bachelor um, suite, maximum about 400, 425 square feet, about $3,000 a month. So if you're wanting an extra room, of course, the cost will go up. And right now, across Canada, higher end um, suites in independent and, and uh, assisted living could be over $6,500 a month. And that doesn't include add-on fees that the building will charge if you need help with um, meals, or someone assisting and taking someone down for meals or helping with med administration, et cetera. Every little bit costs and it could be in 15 minute increments or one hour increments as well. Um, then has a family uh, talked about maybe potential equipment needs. A lot of people have back, you know, achy back problems and, and even making a bed is very difficult. So do they need to get a different kind of bed so that it's um, movable? Or do they need a scooter that's going to cost over $4,000? Um, have they talked about all the legal paperwork that really needs to be uh, finalized? Um, so there's legal fees and then the cost of preparing for end of life. Um, and a lot of times there's going to be pockets missed here and there. So it's really nice to sit down and start developing early. What are we going to do? How are we going to finance this? How are we going to make this change in adjustment? Um, so financially, logistically, and emotionally, um, there's a lot that um, needs to be discussed between a parent and, and a family and their family.
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. And Karen, you mentioned right at the start there that one of the biggest challenges that people face is just not knowing how long to plan for. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, again, you know, having that conversation either with a company like yourself and, and just like family or even with your investment advisor about that health history of the family and what can we anticipate and what can we plan for, even if it's not perfect, is so, so valuable. Well, Karen, thank you for sharing this absolute wealth of information with our audience. And now before we let our guests go, we always like to put them on the spot one more time. And so I'll ask you, what is it that they don't tell you about aging in place? Anna, what they don't tell you about aging in place is that it is the most practical, safe and affordable option, especially if you bring in home care. Seniors say they want to remain in their home and just like family home care agrees, home is the safest place to be. Well, Karen, I think that wraps it up beautifully. So I want to thank you so much for joining us on this episode and being a resource to our clients and to everyone listening or watching today. If you've taken something away from this conversation and you're starting to have these conversations within your own family, then feel welcome to reach out to either Karen at Just Like Family Home Care or to your wealth advisor and just have that talk early and be prepared for what the future might hold. 